this is chapter 9 and um, the first 14 slides actually talk about normal anatomy and physiology of bones, um, muscles and joints. All of you have passed AP1 so you should be so this should be very easy for you to go through. So me not lecturing about it does not mean that it's not part of your curriculum. You can still be asked about it, but I think this material, um, I believe at this point, all of you are able to do this on your own. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or uh, um, talk to me in class. So I'm actually going to start from slide number 15, which are the musculoskeletal diagnostic tests. So what do we do if somebody comes in and has a complaint, whether it's related to their bones, muscles, or their joints? So one of the first tests we do for bone disorders would be an x-ray. Sometimes you can do bone scanning. For muscle disorders, we do what is called an electromyogram or an EMG, where we put probes or electrodes into their muscles and we um, record the electricity that comes out and try to figure out if there are any abnormalities. We can take a muscle biopsy for some muscular disorders. For joint disorders, we can do an x-ray, we can do an MRI, we can do an arthroscope, which is um, a scoping the joint. We can take a little bi try to figure out if there's any um, abnormalities going on inside of the joint. So you can get a better, better picture of what's going on inside. We can even use an arthroscope to biopsy parts of the bone if we believe there is maybe an inflammation or a malignancy. We could also um, take a biopsy or a sample of the synovial fluid and examine that under a microscope. So these are just some examples of the testing that we do for these musculoskeletal disorders. The first thing we're going to be talking about are bone fractures. So a fracture, um, definition of a, of a fracture is the break in the integrity of a bone. So if there is any, if the integrity of the bone, and we see here that the bone integrity is totally disrupted, and there's even displacement in the bone, so it's not continuous anymore. Um, <clears throat> fractures can occur um, in healthy bones due to severe traumas. Um, unhealthy bones, for example, if there's a tumor or if the bone is osteoporotic, those need less than um, heavy traumas to occur. Even a minor trauma can lead to a fracture in some, um, you know, very advanced cases. <clears throat> and um, usually when you want to um, red flag a person with a fracture, you use the hashtag sign. So if you see in, in the medical settings, if you see that hashtag sign, um, that means that this person has a fracture somewhere. These are, are the little the kinds of fractures. Um, right here we can see an oblique fracture. Um, down here, for example, is a transverse fracture. A comminuted fracture is where there is a fracture of the bone, but the bone in between has fragmented into smaller pieces. There's, this right here is an open fracture, and open or closed is in relationship to the skin. So if the skin is open, that is an open fracture. If the skin is still intact, but the bones are fractured on the inside, this is called a closed fracture. We have a pathological fracture, meaning that the, there is a pathology in the bone. That pathology could be a bone tumor. It could be um, TB, for example. It could be osteoporosis, meaning that the bone to begin with was unhealthy, and that caused the fracture. This right here is a segmented fracture where you can see there's a f um, two fractures in the bone, and there is a segment that is not divided into smaller pieces. So unlike the common unit, right here that bone in the middle is totally uh, fragmented while in segmented it's intact. A spiral fracture is where the bone was twisted and then it broke. A green stick fracture, this happens in young kids where the bone is still very malleable so um, and it's called green stick in relationship because we um, we're comparing it if you took a twig off of a tree and a soft twig and you try to break it 
it will bend, but it won't break. And that's the same thing that happens to the bone. The bone is very soft, so if th anything happens where the bone is bent, there is a little bend in the bone, but it doesn't break. <clears throat> An impacted fracture is where one bone has totally pushed itself into the other bone. So for example, if somebody is in a car accident and they extend their legs in front of them, a very common complication that happens is that the um, head of the femur impacts itself into the pelvis. It pushes itself through that, if you guys remember the name of that, the acetabulum, or that hollow part of the pelvis where the um, head of the humerus was supposed to be in there, and that would be an impacted fracture. Coley's fracture is a fracture in the distal part of the radius and the ulna, um, and it usually happens in um, older individuals, usually females, uh, due to osteoporosis. So these are, again, fractures in the distal parts of the radius and the ulna around the wrist. Pott's fracture, on the other hand, are in the ankles, and those happen on the distal parts of the um, tibia and the fibula on either sides, uh, the, so the malleoli on either sides of the ankle um, fracture, and that's called a Potts fracture. Last but definitely not least is the compression fracture that happens where the bone is unhealthy, again usually due to osteoporosis or due to um, a malignancy, and due to the weight of the person, the bone in the middle gets um, compressed and crushed. So there is a compression fracture of the vertebra, vertebrae. So again, these are the classification of fractures. Um, we can say that they're divided into a complete or incomplete. Complete where the total there's a total um, break in the bone. So we have parts that are separated from each other. Incomplete is where um, the bone is broken, but they are not totally separated from each other. If we're talking about the skin, there could be an open or a closed wound. Open is also known as a compound fracture, so the skin is interrupted as well. If the skin is not broken, that's a closed fracture. So then there's a simple comminuted and compression. Simple fracture is like that oblique or the transverse fracture where there is no bone in the middle. Um, so basically, we have broke the bone into two separate pieces. Comminuted, those are multiple fractures where there are bony fragments in the middle. And compression where would be um, where we've compressed the bone or we've crushed the bone in the middle. Other types of fractures that can happen, um, or we're kind of, some of these are a kind of repeating of what we talked about, and some of them are a little bit new. So right here you can see this is normal bony matrix and this right here is a person with osteoporosis so you see that there are bigger gaps and that this bone would definitely be weaker than normal than the normal bone in this area so very easily this person can have an impacted fracture could have a pathological fracture because of the weakness um, in this middle figure that you see here this is called a stress fracture and stress fractures occur due to repetitive stress on the bone. Um, so, for example, <clears throat> if someone is not used to walking and then they decide that they're going to go for a very vigorous jog or a long walk and they are continuously contracting their leg bones and the muscles are always pulling on the tibia, that could lead to separation of some of the bony tissue, some of the bony tissue up on from the bone, as you can see over here, due to the consistent pull of those muscles. That leads to stress fractures. These fractures are very minute fractures. They're usually, um, there's no, the, we don't put the legs in cast or anything, or anything but the person is at to rest, put um, <clears throat> cold, um, packs, ice packs on it, and to make take maybe an anti-inflammatory drug for the pain and for the inflammation to subside. In this case here of a skull, you can see this depressed, depressed fracture where the 
bone is depressed and it um, presses on the brain. So how does a fracture heal, heal? The first thing that happens in a fracture is that there's a lot of bleeding that occurs. So that blood, you can see here, kind of fills the space between the two parts of the bone. And it also pulls on the, pushes on the periosteum. <clears throat> so it causes the stretch of the periosteum, and this is very painful. So the cause of the pain in a bone fracture is because of the stretch of the periosteum, whether it's because of the deformity that happened in the bone or because of the bleeding that is stretching the periosteum. Um, with that blood comes a lot of cells that are really important for the healing process. So we have macrophages, we have osteoblasts, osteoclasts, they're fibroblasts, and chondroblasts. So let's take each cell and see what they do. <coughs> So macrophages, we all know they're phagocytic cells. They are going to get rid of any debris or any foreign bodies, any bugs that are trying to attack in that area. Fibroblasts, those are the cells that we know are responsible for the initiation or the start of any healing process. They will start to deposit fibrous tissue. And um, that fibrous tissue that is put on there leads to what is called a procallus. A procallus is made out of collagen fibers um, where the two parts of the bone that were separated are now connected together with that collagen fiber. So before bone is actually made, there are just fibrous tissue connecting the pieces together. <clears throat> That's why the person has to be in a cast because if it's not, if the bone is not immobilized, then the fibrous tissue will not be able to change into bone and there will always be just um, fibrous tissue connecting the two bony pieces together. Okay, so that's for fibroblasts. Um, chondroblasts, those would replace any cartilage that needs to be replaced. Osteoblasts, we know those are the bone making cells. They'll deposit bones, uh, they'll deposit the bony, the new bony or the osteocytes onto the bone. Um, osteoclasts, are, as we know, those are the bone resorbing cells. And if you guys remember, again, from AP1, that there is a remodeling process where the a lot of bone, extra bony tissue is made, and then there has to be, uh, osteoclasts have to come in and try to remodel the bone into its original shape. So here is a lot of the pathophysiology of the bone that we just talked about. So I'm going to um, you know, we just talked about in that previous slide, so I'm going to let you guys now read that on your own. We've already talked about the healing of the bone fractures using, again, that figure. So the factors that affect bone healing. So I want you guys, before you take a look at the slide, try to think about what do you think would affect the healing of that bone. Well, there are different kinds of things. First of all, we have the kind of fracture. There's the health of the person. Is that person malnourished? Um, is he going to immobilize his foot or just keep on moving? Um, when did the immobilization occur? Did it happen weeks after the fracture or right after the fracture? So did he get appropriate treatment or not? Um, it could also be that is there an infection that was introduced into that area? So that would definitely delay the healing process. So you can see here, these are all different factors that it can affect it. So amount of the damage that happened, um, how much bone, how close together are the bones that were fractured, presence of material, foreign matter or an infection, blood supply, was the blood supply to that area, was it Im impaired or not? Um, and other factors such as the age of the per person, nutrition, is the person anemic or not? These are all things that could affect bone healing. For complications that happen for bone fractures, well, if the person is not immobilized correctly, then there could be bone deformities that can happen. Um, if it's multiple fractures that happen, or it happens really early at an age, at an early age, that person um, years later can develop arthritis because of that fracture that happened to him earlier on. It could be um, infection can happen, ischemia if the blood supply is was impacted it could even cause nerve damage if the fracture caused um, 
if the bony parts tore the nerves. Okay, um, another thing that I have here is the fat embolus. A fat embolus means that because of the fracture, fat entered into the blood supply, entered the circulation. This is actually a life-threatening thing. So a lot of people or some individuals develop these fat emboli and then this so this person now in their circulation has like a bolus of fat if that when if and when that bolus of fat reaches the lungs or reaches the heart that could lead to heart failure and sudden death because of the fracture so it's not the fracture itself that caused the death it is the fat that entered into the circulation because of the fracture now, how do you treat a fracture? Well, if it's a, we can do either a closed or an open reduction. Closed reduction means that um, without opening up the patient, the bones are put back into their initial position, and then a cast is put. An open reduction means that there is either too much damage to ha to do the closed reduction, or we have to open up the person to align. So this is there's surgery involved, and now then we can align the bones together. Sometimes the person needs um, a plate or pins or rods in order to keep the bone intact. Compartment syndrome is a complication that can happen due to fractures um, where there is too much swelling caused by the fracture, and that swelling leads to com more and more compression on the nerves and the blood vessels in the area. And that could eventually lead, that compression or that edema that is now compressing the blood vessels decreases the amount of blood going into that area and that can lead to ischemia and gangrene of the fractured part. So it's called compartment syndrome. Um, and it's just not the fracture that can cause it. And I ha kind of have it in bold at the end of the slide that a cast, if a cast is too tight, that can also cause compartment syndrome. So if you find that a person has a cast on and they're showing signs and symptoms of compression sy compartment syndrome, then the cast has to be removed and a new, a new one is put on that is not as tight. Um, <clears throat> now we're going to be talking about dislocations. Dislocation means that two bones that form a joint are now immobilized in a way where that joint is dis um, deformed. So there's no break in the bones, but they're not in their normal positions. Um, the com one of the most common kinds, or the ease, one of the easy, actually relatively easier joints to de to dislocate are, is the shoulder joint. So you see here the head of the humerus is, is dislocated from the glenoid cavity of the scapula and it usually goes downwards and if you guys remember that in the axillary region we have the brachial plexus and we have the blood vessels the um, axillary artery and vein going into the upper limb so there's a good chance that if this happens that nerve damage and vascular damage can happen um, to the nerve supply and the blood vessels supplying the upper limb Um, <clears throat> dislocations tend to happen to repeat themselves so if this happens once the, the person has the tendency for this dislocation to happen to recur again and in that case um, surgery might be required now the difference between sprain and a strain sprain with a P is a tear in a ligament while strain with a T is a tear in a tendon. So that helps a little bit. Strain with a T is a tear in a tendon with a T. Um, but if that tendon is or ligament is totally separated from their bony attachment, that is called an avulsion. And to treat these cases, you need to immobilize the person. And again, if you remember from AP2 or AP1, not sure which one of those, but we talked about how the blood supply of tendons and ligaments, um, some of them are even avascular, meaning they have very low blood supply. So healing process tends to take months for a tendon or ligament to heal. It's a very long process. Now, other joint injuries are, for example, muscle tears, usually due to overuse of the muscle, <clears throat> repetitive strain injuries, and these are injuries that occur over a period of time. Um, for 
in which the same movement is repeated. So if, <clears throat> for example, on keyboards or using the mouse or running and jogging, these can cause the repetitive, these can cause the strain injuries. Now a little about muscle tears. Um, <clears throat> these can cause are caused sometimes by a trauma or due to overextension or overstressing of the muscle. If repetitive tears happen, then the muscles will repair with fibrous tissue and a fibrous scar. So there, now we have a muscle that has fibrous scar in it. There are three different degrees of muscle tear. One, first degree, that's a small percentage of muscle fibers. The second degree is more of the muscle is torn, but it's not a complete tear, which makes the third degree a complete tear of the muscle. Treatment of joint injuries, we've talked about the RICE <coughs> um, steps to do, which are rest, immobilization, compression, and elevation of the joint. We can give them something for the pain and for the inflammation, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, physical therapy sometimes needed, and massage of the surrounding tissue. <coughs> massage does a couple of things. First of all, it helps get it helps to get rid of the edema and the swelling that's in the area. It also increases the blood supply um, to the area, bringing in new blood with new macrophages and fibroblasts to start to complete the healing process. Now we're going to be talking a little bit about bone disorders. So the first disorder to talk about is osteoporosis, which is a decrease in the bone mass and the density of the bone. There are two kinds primary and secondary. <clears throat> primary um, is idiopathic, and idiopathic is just a fancy word for to say that we have no idea why it's caused, okay? But then again, in healthcare, we don't like to say that, so we just give it a fancy meaning, which gives the impression that we kind of know what we're talking about, but we don't. So the primary or idiopathic, this happens in older ages, so 50 and higher. It occurs, do, do we think it's happening because of the decrease or um, relative decrease in the sex hormones and relative decrease in calcium intake or absorption. Secondary osteoporosis occurs on top of another disorder. So um, there is something else going on in the bone and as a result of that um, osteoporosis is one of, is a complication. So it's um, in order to treat secondary osteoporosis the best way is to actually treat the original cause. So the pathophysiology of osteoporosis, this is actually extremely important because it's a relatively common disease or relatively common disorder, um, so it's important to understand. Um, where there, remember, there's usually a balance between bone deposition and bone resorption, or bone making and bone breaking. In osteoporosis, there's a loss of this balance where bone resorption is now more um, than bone making or bone formation. That results in loss of compact bone. So spongy bone is not related to osteoporosis. We're affecting the compact bone. And remember, compact bone is the part of the bone that gives it strength. Um, you can usually diagnose it with bone density scans or DEXA scans um, because, again, there is that loss of the bone strength that can lead to compression fractures, fractures in the wrist, in the hip, can also lead to spine deformities like scoliosis and kyphosis, and we're going to talk about these deformities more in detail later on in this chapter. <clears throat> Predisposing factors of osteoporosis, usually 50 up. Um, it's usually related to menopause. Um, decreased mobility or sedentary life, so being active and exercising regularly decreases the, um, the risk of having osteoporosis. Hormonal factors, so like I said, it's kind of related to menopause, so a relative decrease in estrogen. Um, it even happens in males as well, although it's still more common in females, but the relative decrease in testosterone is also a cause in males. Or excessive glucocorticoids, like cortisone or parathyroid hormones, are also factors. Decrease in the amount of calcium, vitamin D, or protein. Cigarette smoking. Lower BMI, so in very skinny individuals being of Caucasian um, or Asian ancestry. These are all um, risk factors for osteoporosis. And treatment for osteoporosis, 
it kind of depends on the risk factors. You want to reduce the risk factors, first of all. So you want to prevent osteoporosis before it occurs. So remember, first day we talked, we said that, um, you know, real medicine is to prevent the occurrence of a disease and not wait to, for it to happen and then treat it. So you want to tell your patient, especially <clears throat> if they're 40 up or... Um, if they're Caucasian or Asian in ancestry, you want to make sure they're not smoking. So if they're smoking, want you ask them to quit. If they're sedentary in their if not exercising, you want to ask them to exercise regularly, increase their intake of calcium. Um, if they're menopausal, you can give them. Um, if they're, you know, a candidate for them, you can give them um, hormone replacement therapy. You would also, if they're underweight, you want to make sure that they're within their healthy. Um, BMI or healthy weight. You, in, you can give them physical therapy if they need it. Sometimes they will need even more than that to now to treat if somebody actually gets this. You can give them bisphosphonates, for example, Fosamax and Boniva, calcitonin or HPH, which is human parathyroid hormones. <clears throat> These are all um, things that are used for treatment. The next bone def abnormality, rickets and osteomalacia. Rickets and osteomalacia are basically the same thing. It all depends on the age of occurrence. So if it happens in kids, it's called rickets. If it happens in adults, it's called osteomalacia. And it results from the deficiency of vitamin D and phosphates, making the bone very weak and very malleable. <coughs> It can be caused due to starvation, so in areas of the world where there's malnutrition um, or dietary deficiencies, it could be that the person has a malabsorption syndrome, so they're taking the calcium, but the intestines are unable to um, absorb it. Some medications sometimes do this. So, for example, phenobarbital, which is given to kids that have seizure disorders, or lack of sun exposure, um, these are all causes for rickets and osteomalacia. Okay, in children, you can see here, because of the weight of the person, or the weight of this child, the, and the bones cannot withstand that weight, and they start to bow, they're called bow leggings, or um, bowing of the legs. Okay, in adults, the soft bones can let, lead to compression factors. This disease here is called the Paget's disease or the bone. Um, it usually occurs in older individuals, so 40 up. Um, again, we really don't not need, know the exact cause of the disease, but what we do know is that the bony tissue it becomes destroyed and it's replaced by fibrous tissue. And then um, during that process of bone destruction, multiple fractures happen and then they have to heal themselves. Um, for example, you can see here in the skull, that there's a loss of the sutures, the bones are totally deformed, and there's even new bone formation <coughs> on the inner surface of the skull, and that leads to brain compression of the brain and the cranial nerves that leads to severe pain. The next abnormality we have is osteomyelitis, which is actually the infection of a bone. Um, that Osteomyelitis can be caused either by bacteria or by fungi. The signs and symptoms, well, just like any inflammation or any infection, there is swelling, redness, edema, severe pain. Person can get systemic effects like chills and fever and malaise. The treatment depends on the cause of the osteomyelitis. So if it's caused by bacteria, you want to give an antibiotic. If it's called by a fungus, you want to give an antifungal medic medicine. Um, usually they're given by um, intravenous because these infections are... Um, very severe and very dangerous and they could spread to the rest of the body. Sometimes if the infection doesn't subside, surgery may be acquired, um, needed in order to remove that part of the bone that's infected to prevent the spread of the infection. Now, now for the abnormal curves of the spine, um, if you look at this lady right here, this, ha this is a normal spine with the normal curves in the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral areas. The this right here is scoliosis, where the spine is not aligned in the middle, but it gives more of an S or a C shaped. So this is curved sideways. Right here, this is kyphosis, which is the scientific term for hunchback or humpback. And it happens in the thoracic, in the thoracic um, area. 
lordosis, which is an exaggeration of the lumbar, normal lumbar lordosis. So normally there is a lumbar lordosis, but if it's exaggerated, um, that where it becomes a pathology, pathology or um, leading to lower back pain that can happen for instance during pregnancies um, it, overweight individuals and it's usually if the fat is in the abdominal area and it's usually done in order to maintain balance while walking now for tumors and just like any tumor malignant we're talking here malignant tumors they can be primary or secondary primary means that it started in the bone Secondary tumor means that it started somewhere else and then it spread to the bone. Um, the most common primary tumor of the bone is called an osteosarcoma. And this is an unfortunate, unfortunately this is usually happens in kids and in younger teens and teens or younger adults. It happens in the shafts of the long bones and one of the first signs of it would be pain in the bones um, at rest. Okay, so this is kind of a warning sign um, that not anybody that has this kind of pain means that they have osteosarcoma, but it is a red flag that you definitely want to keep in mind. As for um, secondary tumors of the bone, the primaries are usually from breast or prostate or the lungs. Okay, so that's where the primary is, and then these, the breast, prostate, and lung cancers have a high tendency of spreading to bones. This right here is an osteosarcoma, so you can see um, that it happens in the shaft of the lung bones. Other bone cancers that can happen, um, an example here, you have a chondrosarcoma, and you can see that uh, that com comes from chondrocytes. So there, these are cartilage cells, and you can kind of see that bluish discoloration. If you guys remember from the AP1 slides, looking at chondrocytes, they were kind of like bluish in color. So when they have this a lot of multiplication and they become cancerous, they can actually kind of see it more exaggerated. This, more, this happens more in adults. Ewing sarcoma, right here you can see that Ewing sarcoma. This happens in teens and it also affects the shafts of long bones. Bony cancers tend to spread to lungs at, a ver or at an early stage of the disease and that's why you want to diagnose these tumors as early as possible. And what are the treatment options that you have? Well, you have to excise the tumor, even if that means um, amputation of the limb just to save the person's life, and chemotherapy to reduce metastasis, to make sure that you didn't miss any malignant cells, um, or if there are any that have already spread into the lymph nodes or otherwise that we killed them all. Another abnormality is called muscular dystrophy. This, these are autosomal, autosomal recessive disorders, meaning that they are genetic disorders. The good thing is being that they are recessive, meaning that you have to have a gene coming from the mother and a gene coming from the father. So, so both mom and dad have to be carriers of this disease in order for their kids to get this disease. Had it been an autosomal dominant disorder, then just one parent being a carrier would mean that all their kids will have it. But this is an autosomal recessive, so both parents have to be carriers. This tends to happen more in cultures where um, cousins get married. Um, so these kind of tend to run in families. It's a degeneration of skeletal muscles over time. And the prototype is called Duchenne muscle dystrophy or pseudohypertrophic muscle dystrophy. Um, they're the same thing. So Duchenne or pseudohypertrophic muscular dystrophy are the same thing. Um, and it is called pseudohypertrophic because if you look at the muscles, the muscles are huge, but they are not muscle cells anymore. They are actually replaced. The muscle cells have been um, died, they're atrophic, and they're replaced by fat cells. So that bulk of muscle, the bulk that you see is not muscle, it's actually fat. And that's why it's called pseudohypertrophic muscular dystrophy. And this affects young boys. 
um, the signs and symptoms are that the kid is fine and then all they start it's a very gradual um, um, signs and symptoms that sometimes can be missed until later on so the that child that was walking fine starts tripping but then again you're like oh well all kids fall so you know parents might not really notice it until it gets really bad um, so early motor weakness but the, again, the parent is not going to come to you and say that um, my child has motor weakness. They are going to say that there's a lot of falling, um, unable to go up and down the stairs, although they used to be able to do that. There's a little waddling gait because the pelvic girdle muscles are now weak. Um, if you ask the kid to sit down on the ground and then ask them to get up, they can't jump up like normal kids do. They have to first get on their hands and feet and then push themselves up. And this is very characteristic to Duchenne. It's called Gower's Maneuver. If you take, you find their reflexes, they're reduced. And then because of the muscle dystrophy, deformities start to happen. So their backs can get deformed where they can get scoliosis or kyphosis. Um, their respiratory muscles are becoming Hi, um, atrophic and that can lead to respiratory infections very late in very late stages their mu even their cardiac muscles become atrophic and leads to cardiac myopathy and it's the respiratory infections and the cardiac myopathy that can um, are fatal to these kids to diagnose the first thing you want to do is an EMG Okay, you can also take swabs of the parents' saliva and get them tested, so genetic testing of the parents. Um, blood levels of creatine kinase. Creatine kinase is, um, or are, enzymes that are released by the muscle when the muscle becomes atrophic. So the muscle cells will die and will release into the circulation an enzyme called creatine kinase. And if you find the level of this enzyme in these kids, they'll ele they're, they are elevated. Again, you could do an EMG. You could take a biopsy of the muscle. You, there's also an increase in a protein called dystrophin in their blood. Unfortunately, there's no cure of this disease. The only thing you can do is kind of palliative treatment, physical therapy. If there's a respiratory infection, you'd have to treat it. When they will eventually develop into respiratory failure, so you can give them, put them on a ventilator. Um, things they can do to help prevent this is massage therapies, um, breathing exercises to teach the mom to do with the kid. You could give them physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, and then unfortunately again there's really no treatment for this so this is something uh, there's a lot of research being done on genetic therapies to try to help these kids. The next disorder is fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia means that these um, First, before we started, this is a disease, another disease where we don't fully understand what's going on. Um, but we do know that some of the muscle tissue becomes inflamed and changes into fibrous tissue, leading to muscle pain, muscle stiffness, weakness. Um, there's also sleep disturbances and anxiety or depression that can also be found in these patients. We really don't know, is it the anxiety and depression that started first that led to fibromyalgia or is it the other way around? We, again, the exact cause or the exact pathophysiology um, in the body is not fully understood, but there's um, an imbalance in serotonin, and that's why that leads to either an anxiety or depression, usually depressed depression. An increase in production of substance P, if you guys remember, substance P was a chemical in the brain that helps decrease pain sorry, that helps increase um, the feeling of pain. So when you have that substance be increased, that leads to more pain. And as I said, it's closely related to depression. Some people um, get better or the fibromyalgia gets better with antidepressants. Sometimes you'd have to give them um, physical therapy you want to give make sure that they are they exercise regularly the um, 
application maybe of heat, massage can help. Because of the pain, you want to give them maybe analgesics like Tylenol or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, new drugs are being tried like L Lyrica or the pre treatment. And the usual clinical picture are females between the age of 20 to 50, a little bit depressed. They have sleep disorders. Um, they usually have menstrual abnormalities, um, fatigue because of the sleep disorders and the pain that they're in. Sometimes they even show signs of hypothyroidism. So if you treat that and you, um, you give them a little bit of thyroxin hormone, that could sometimes treat the fibromyalgia as well. All of this is still under investigation. There's a lot of research being done. So um, again, it's one of those things that you might want to research yourself when you get into the field of healthcare. I'm going to stop at this point. So this will be the first part of chapter nine and I will post the second part um, by tomorrow.